Greetings and peace. I hope you and yours are doing well today, wherever you might be watching this from. Now the uh, title of this presentation will be Prominent African American Freemasons in honor of Black History Month for February 2020. Now um, I've been looking around at all the uh, different um, avenues of education that are out there and there's no one that has um, did like a whole presentation in terms of uh, Black History Month and honoring all of our brothers that hail from that background and I've been um, making videos about different Eastern uh, religions and philosophies and their similarities to Freemasonry so you know I thought why not do this as well because in my eyes we're all brothers and we're all equal and everyone needs to be represented so please uh, join me as I uh, present this and I thank you all for watching and I wish you all well thank you now the brother behind all of this is no other than Prince Hall himself, an abolitionist, a war veteran of the Revolutionary War. He was a community activist who started theater and forums to help his people. He ran a school for black children out of his own home, and he was known to be somebody that was there to uplift the fallen state of mankind and his people at the same time. Prince Hall and 14 other black men petitioned for admittance to the all-white Boston St. John's Lodge. As uh, racial tensions of that time, they were turned down. And having been rejected by the uh, American uh, Freemasonry, Hall and uh, the others that were in his group sought and were initiated into masonry by members of Lodge No. 441 of the Grand Lodge of Ireland on March 6, 1775. Now the lodge was attached to the uh, British forces that were stationed in Boston and then uh, once all was said and done after the war Hall and uh, the other freedmen founded African Lodge number no. one and he was named Grand Master. The Grand Master of the, uh, the Mother Grand Lodge of England at the time, his name was His Royal Highness the Duke of Cumberland, he issued a charter for African Lodge number no. one later renamed African Lodge number 459 on September 29, 1784. Now the reason this was happening because uh, Prince Hall and the uh, other brothers that were with him at the time, they were not being accepted in the uh, here in the U.S. when they were trying to petition to join because of the uh, viewpoints at the time. So England was the one, even, even after fighting a, a war and on all on both sides it was still them that honored his request the lodge was the country's first masonic lodge due to the african lodge's popularity and prince hall's leadership the grand lodge of england made hall a provincial grand master on january 27 1791 and then uh, his responsibilities were to uh, do the subsequent reports and the uh, situations of the lodges and then back and forth such as the communications happen between Grand Lodge and the subordinate lodges. And then as time went on, in um, March 22nd, 1797, he organized the lodge in Philadelphia, calling it African Lodge Number 459, under the charter of Prince Hall. So he was basically, through the charter he received from England, he started um, issuing charters uh, and lodges under that same charter so it started building a network and an umbrella under that re regular recognized charter that he received for him to operate uh, masonry in the United States and eventually they later received their own charter so in uh, June 25th 1797 he reorganized African Lodge and then it was later known as Hiram Lodge number no. three at Providence Rhode Island and Prince Hall himself is a wonderful, wonderful figure and a, and a great human being because he sought to do what was right always. He tried to help his fellow man and he knew what the struggle was, especially at that time for racial disparities. And he saw Freemasonry as a venue, just like how I see it today. I came to this country as an immigrant, as a Pakistani Muslim. So I understand Brother Prince Hall's, Prince Hall's point of view and I respect him for what he has done because Freemasonry is one place where no matter who you are, what you believe, what your racial background or socioeconomic status is, we can all meet on the level and our values and examples can teach the world in the post-2020 world now more than ever 
especially people think we're advanced, but I think we're more backwards now than we ever been with how the ignorance is reigning in our communities. We need to all come together and know that if we can love one another, why can't the world? So I really respect this brother and this man for what he has done and what he has done in terms of being an abolitionist for slavery and he was uh, going against those that were being sold into slavery and he set an example at the time of his death that he had not only had full voting rights but he was also a free man a property owner and because of his many contributions like September 7 every year that's known as Prince Hall Day and uh, I'm honored to do this presentation and may his soul and his memory rest in peace as I continue presenting this uh, video so thank you and uh, let's move on to the uh, next slide this is the uh, original charter that was issued by the uh, mother Grand Lodge of England at the time to Prince Hall now there was an incident in uh, Massachusetts where I guess some of their records burned down in a fire but thankfully this survived with God's plan and now it is being kept safe in Massachusetts in a sheet of uh, heavy glass in between it to preserve this historical document and to prove to all the naysayers that Prince Hall Masonry in America is reg regular and recognized by the Mother Grand Lodge of England. So I wanted to make sure that I showed this and this can be looked up and its records can be verified online as it was validated as time went on by all the Masonic researchers and scholars. These are the names of the uh, original 15 brothers, including Prince Hall himself, that were the uh, backbones of starting the uh, first African-American lodge in the United States. So they were Prince Hall, Cyrus Johnston, Buston Slinger, John Canton, Peter Freeman, Peter Best, Prince Reese, Duff Reform, Thomas uh, Sanderson, Prince Raiden, Cato Spine, Boston Smith, Benjamin Tyler, Fortin Howard, and Richard Tightly. So excuse me if I mi mispronounced anything, but I wanted to make sure that the uh, original 15 brothers that started Prince Hall Masonry were recognized by their names and uh, may their souls rest in peace as their work has expanded nationwide. The example of Prince Hall's love for his community is even shown today as he himself ran a school and program for black children out of his own home. And we see that exemplified by the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, where they have in the school district of Philadelphia their own Prince Hall Public School. And it is a, one of the mo best schools that Philadelphia has to offer for the children. And they have good teachers, good curriculum, Everything is advanced, state of the art, and they make sure they have good programs that benefit the schools, the kids, and the parents. And this is an amazing ordeal because one of Masonry's tenets is community activism. And in order for Masonry to survive in the 21st, 22nd century, we need to be more involved with the community. So that way, when they walk past the Masonic Lodge, they know that Oh, th these were the people who the school is named after, or they, this is what they do for the parents and the children. And um, I believe that we have a lot to learn from our Prince Hall brothers for their uh, love and activism for their communities and how loyal they are to each other and how sharp they are in all that they do. So I want to make sure that they are recognized and everyone else follows their example of community activism because that's the only way to survive in the transhumanist uh, technology future that's overtaken all of us is you have to be a part of the hearts and minds of your community and Prince Hall is a pillar of that example and, and uh, also honoring the teachings of Prince Hall himself for educate, educating your children and guiding them properly. As of recently after the mainstream Grand Lodge and Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Florida both recognized each other we now have 44 U.S. Grand Lodges, including Alaska, Hawaii, and D.C., that recognize their Prince Hall brothers, roughly being around 86%, uh, you could say. Now, I would say that 
true masonry sees no color, sees no faith, sees no socioeconomic status because a love for your brother is always eternal, whether he's a CEO of a corporation or he's a janitor at a local school doesn't make a difference because we're all equal as children and under the fatherhood of God. So we need to love and respect one another. Prince Hall Masonry is regular and recognized under the Mother Grand Lodge of England. And they got their start just like how all of the U.S. Grand Lodges got their start. By getting their charters from the Mother Grand Lodge of England where everything started. Now I think we all need to... For those that have not recognized our Prince Hall brothers, we need to put our egos down, put our prides down, and know that everything we do in this life, we're going to leave it. Whether it's your money, your car, your Masonic titles, everything is going to go away because that's the mortality that we're, we are uh, taught to uh, appreciate every day, right? It's our mortality. We don't know how much time we have, but with the time that we have been given... Why not act like children of God and love and respect one another? What's this issue of, I don't recognize you or you or you don't recognize me? Who are we at the end of the day? We're nobody. I could uh, have all the titles and power in the world and my eyes don't open tomorrow. Who am I? And what authority do I have from our Supreme Grand Master, Almighty God, to recognize certain people and not recognize others? And um, I'm speaking for myself at this point. I do not represent any Grand Lodge statement or opinions. And I believe that these uh, jurisdictions that are still in white and they haven't recognized their Prince Hall brothers because they consider them clandestine. I consider them clandestine because they're not following what true Freemasonry is teaching. And I pray that because they are still my brothers at, in the end that they do what's right. And one day I wake up and see all of this map as blue. Because the only way that our brotherhood will survive in the future is if we stand together. And um, that's the only way. Because united we stand, divided we fall. And all of, all of the principles of what this country was founded on. And all the basis of um, the regular recognized Freemasonry is that we're all under that same umbrella. Where we started our roots from in 1717. So we all need to love and respect one another because that's the only way. And those with an agenda, well, the question of mortality comes to you as well. How long can you uh, maintain your power on things? Times, people, things, seasons, everything changes with time. And if we don't get our act together, then time will get the best of us. So let's move on to covering the prominent African-American brother Freemasons that I wanted to cover in this presentation. The first brother I would like to cover is brother Nat King Cole, born on uh, March 17, 1919, and passed away to the Celestial Grand Lodge above on February 15, 1965. Now this was one of uh, brother Cole's favorite quote that I liked is, if you smile through your fear and sorrow, smile and maybe tomorrow you'll see the sun come shining through for you. And as Masons, we're always taught to keep smiling, go through all the tragedies of life, and always keep your head up high because the light of the sun and the light within us, the light of our temple, is what defines us as human beings. Now, a little bit about uh, Brother Cole's background is that he grew up in Chicago, and um, by age 12, he sang and played the organ in his uh, church where his uh, father was the uh, local pastor. And then as time went on in his life, he formed his first jazz group known as the Royal Dukes. Five years down the road in 1937, after touring with, the, uh, with his group, he began playing in the, the jazz clubs in Los Angeles, which is symbolic because of the uh, relationship between jazz and Freemasonry, which is a different topic on its own. Where there he formed the, uh, the King Cole Trio with uh, guitarist Oscar Moore, which was later replaced by Irving Ashby, and bassist uh, Wesley Prince, who was also replaced by Johnny Miller. Then um, the trio specialized in swing music with a delicate touch, and they had drummers and like uh, their own ways of playing the piano and guitar, often juxtaposed, and they make sure that it was all like a synchronistic sound. So with all the tools and the instruments they had, as a builder, Nat King Cole's job as a mason and as a musician and builder was to 
uh, performing in such a beautiful way that it all sounded like one sound. So he was basically the music that we hear today with like beats and basses and drums all coming through the same rhythm. It comes from how Brother Nat King Cole exemplified it. So today's artists and musicians should thank him for being the first one who uh, impacted the music industry in such a way, especially at that time. And he was such a big influence on those that play jazz, piano, and he was just known to be on the point. He was clean cut and on the point with all that he did. And I want to give him credit for the contributions he made to the uh, music industry and musicians in general. Because that music we hear today with all the uh, synchronistic beats, it's all, it's all uh, started from Brother Nat King Cole. So I want to give him a shout out. The second brother I would like to cover is Brother Booker T. Washington, born April 5th, 1856, and passed away to the Celestial Grand Lodge above on November 14, 1915. And this is one of the quotes by Brother Booker that I would like to uh, discuss is, No man who continues to add something to the material, intellectual, and moral well-being of the place in which he lives is long left without proper reward. So he's just basically solidifying that those that don't leave anything behind for their people or their community, what are you really leaving behind and what are you really taking with you as time goes on? And we saw that, how he himself was born into slavery and how he himself as a civil rights activist fought for all of his people and to uplift the fallen state of his people and mankind in general which was his duty as a free man and as a mason. And, you know, in the South, there was a peak where there were lynchings left and right. And that's when Brother Booker gave his speech known as the Atlanta Compromise, which uh, brought him a lot of attention and hate from those who wanted to hate him at that time of racial disparity. And he called for his people and black progress through education, starting businesses, and he, he, he was saying that instead of you directly challenging the Jim Crow laws and segregation and how the hate was uh, spread against the black people in the South, against their voting rights and their life in general, how you win is through your success. Get education, get your degrees, get inside the corporate systems and become entrepreneurs, become homeowners, become own something, educate yourself on something. That's how you win because that's how he believed that re the best revenge was your success. You don't need to challenge anything but to continue improving your own self, which is uh, was perfect for him as a Mason to uh, imply that towards his people and his messages. And he put himself through a school and became a teacher after the Civil War in 1881. He was the founder of the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in Alabama. No, uh, now known as Tuskegee University, which grew immensely and focused on training African Americans in farming and other uh, agriculture uh, pursuits in their life. He was also a political advisor and writer, and he often clashed with a fellow brother, which who was uh, Brother W. E. B. Du Bois, over the best avenues for racial uplift. And uh, Brother Washington was himself a first African-American to be invited to the White House dinner by Teddy Roosevelt, which at that time was seen as an uproar because the, those who wanted to practice racism were like, he's basically equal now with the uh, leader of the free world. How could that be possible? And in terms of his clash with uh, Brother W.E.B. Du Bois, you see that because uh, the thing about Freemasonry is that we are all brothers, but... Sometimes in certain avenues of life, you will be on the opposite sides of each other. So you still love and respect each other, but somebody wants to take this venue and this other person wants to take another venue to their approach. And then you love and respect each other in that way. Just how you have in the Civil War, where brothers from both sides, when they could help each other, they did. Same thing with the relationship between uh, Saladin and Richard the Lionheart in the Third Crusade opposite sides but you know when they had a chance to respectfully discourse with each other and to uh, give respect to each other they did and brother uh, Booker T Washington was a com was a complex uh, individual at the time in which he lived 
and he lived in such a time where there was racial inequality and he was trying to uh, I guess take a more relaxed approach which I guess some some people didn't like and he was uh, handling court cases he was encouraging like different um, parts of his communities to become educated to become owners and I think Brother Booker T. Washington's legacy as the head of, his, uh, head of the Tuskegee Institute until his death is to just keep, you got to keep up the good work in all that you do. No matter what socioeconomic status, uh, you know, life might throw you in. Uh, Brother Booker T. Washington basically tells us that you have to do what's right for you and you have to keep improving yourself. You could be put in the worst system possible, but you have all the potential within you to one day to start a family, to get educated, get a good career, become a car owner, homeowner. You could do everything that the other person said that you couldn't do. So that's the example that he left behind for all of us. And may his soul rest in peace. In respect to Brother uh, Booker T. Washington, now we'd like to talk about Brother W.E.B. Du Bois who also reinforced the values of education and of equality of all mankind. And he saw education as a form of a revolutionary idea. And one of his quotes that I like is, education among all kinds of men always had and always will have an element of danger and revolution of dissatisfaction and discontent. Now, I really like this quote because Brother W.E.B. Du Bois basically reinforcing the idea that education is the biggest weapon you can have in your life because that's an idea that no one can ever take away from you even if somebody takes you down that idea that you left behind or whatever you were able to impact somebody's heart mind and future your legacy and your idea and thought lives on forever and he exemplified that even if he was at odds at, with his own brother they exemplified the, their values in own way and uh, with brother W.E.B. Du Bois him as a sociologist he a historian civil rights act activist one of the first pan-african um, authors and ex as a revolutionary educator he basically taught us that you know what we all have that potential within us and to achieve whatever we can achieve and at that time he completed his graduate studies at University of Berlin and Harvard he was the first African-American to earn a doctorate there and eventually he became a professor down the road at Atlanta University and due to his contributions he was seen as a member of the uh, African-American leadership and uh, that's as also time went on he was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored Peoples in 1909, which we know, now know as NAACP. So e even after like his life that he was involved in, he was the one that left that foundation for NAACP for all the things that they did in the civil rights movement in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So he, he was one of the founding fathers that laid that foundation where subsequently after that, where Martin Luther King Jr. and everyone after, after who came in contact with this organization were able to make the impact that they did. And I thank him for what he did and may his soul rest in peace with the beautiful life that he lived from February 23rd, 1868 and passing to the celestial Grand Lodge above, August 27, 1963. May his soul rest in peace, and may we continue to preserve his ideas of education for all, no matter who you are. I would now like to talk about Brother Thurgood Marshall, born July 2nd, 1908, and passed to the celestial Grand Lodge above on January 24, 1993. And one of his quotes that I like is, In recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. So there's that um, quote of recognition again. So we owe it to ourselves in the eyes of Almighty God to love one another, to stand up for each other, and to recognize one another. It costs you zero dollars and zero cents to tell someone you love them and you appreciate them for who they are. It only uplifts them. And that's our job right now, 
as builders and as masons to uplift the fallen state of mankind. So a little bit about Brother uh, Marshall's background is that in his time growing up in, in the, uh, the time period that he did of racial disparity, he got interested in law as his father would often bring him to events that involved debates on law and different forms of legalese. And he himself, as a brother Mason, has made history as the first African American to be a Supreme Court Justice. And as he was going through his uh, law career, he also worked a clinic at night helping those in need because that's what a Mason's job is, to help whoever he can, however he can, because others come before you. And he also tackled many, many issues, not just the equality towards the African American community, but also the equal pay, which is still an issue for teachers today. So he conquered this issue for a lot of African American teachers of the equal pay after he graduated from Howard University's law school. This is like the first issue he went after. And a after time went on, he also in Maryland and in other states as well, like across the South, he not only fought for the working equality rights of African Americans, but also the, the, uh, the pay that the educators were getting. And also, mainly he focused on discrimination cases as well. So, Brown versus Board of Education, Brother Thurgood Marshall was behind that, which was the desegregation of the school system. So, there was a Brother Mason and a prominent Brother Mason from the African American community who was involved in dismantling Brown versus Board of Education and to make sure that all African Americans were treated equally in the workforce and they were being properly honored with the wages that they deserve. So my love and respect to him and may his soul rest in peace. One of my favorite brothers that I would like to talk about is Brother Medgar Evers, who was born on July 2nd, 1925 and passed away to the Grand Lodge above on June 12th, 1963 due to an assassination. Now, one of my favorite quotes from Brother Medgar is, When you hate, the only person that suffers is you, because most of the people you hate don't know it, and the rest don't care. So he's basically saying that those that hate others, you're only spewing that, uh, that venom and that hatred in your own self. And we, we owe it to ourselves to love one another, because what does hating really gain you, and what has it gained us so far? Now... Brother Medgar's resume is amazing. He was a civil rights activist in Mississippi. He was their uh, state secretary for the NAACP. And he was also a World War veteran who served in the United States Army, earning the rank of a sergeant. So at, in the University of Mississippi, he worked day and night to overturn segregation of public facilities, of the school system, university system, and he worked hard to expand opportunities for African Americans. I also believe he had an encounter with Malcolm X, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at that time where all these civil rights issues and activism was taking place. So he also expanded the opportunities for his people and also included the enforcement of voting rights. So he wanted to make sure that his people were treated as fellow human beings and he did good. Because all, all that he did, it made sure that he was making enemies and he pissed off enough people. Because if you're not making enemies and pissing people off in your quest to uplift humanity, then that means there's something you're not doing right. And Brother Medgar, may God rest his soul, he, he was really about it. You know, some people just talk the talk, but he walked the walk. So he practiced what he preached. Even though he had to pay for it with his life. His impact is immortalized because we're still here praising him and honoring his memory and looking at America today where it's still not perfect and it still has a lot of issues that need to be worked on. But it could not have gotten here to the foundation that it is currently without, without the sacrifice and the love and the activism of people like Brother Medgar Evers. And I'm, I'm very proud and honored that in uh, 2017, President Obama designated Evers' home a National Historic Landmark. 
So right before he left office, I believe. So may this brother rest in peace and let us preserve his memory to make sure that everyone continues to be treated equally no matter what. And this brother had to teach us by paying the price of his life. So let us not disappoint his spirit in our, uh, by continuing our work to help one another. This is a brother that many recognize because of his contributions to the field of comedy, Hollywood, and being an award-winning actor and comedian in all that he did. Now this is brother Richard Pryor, born on December 1st, 1940, and passed away to the Celestial Grand Lodge above on December 10, 2005. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes that I picked out about Brother Richard Pryor, where he says, I believe the ability to think is a blessing. If you can think about a situation, you can deal with it. The big struggle is to keep your head clear enough to think. Now, Brother Richard Pryor is giving us life-saving advice because most of the time people end up in consequences or making bad decisions or on their impulses of anger and emotion. And he's telling us that to deal with all of your life's problem, just sit down and think, how should I handle it and how should I approach it? And he's teaching us to handle problems by sitting down with a clear mind, thinking about it, recognize the problem, and taking responsibility for it. So Brother Richard Pryor, because of his uh, tragic childhood, he taught us the values of love because he saw he felt pain and he knew what pain was and he did his job by making sure that not even not just being uh, the forefather of the african-american comedian community so all of the african-american comedians that came after richard pryor opened it to him because he broke he broke the glass ceiling he he raised the bar and he broke the ceiling so everyone that came after him could do it because of the foundation that he had built for them with his a sacrifice and the stories of, of his tragic childhood and how he saw laughter and comedy as a venue to not just uplift his own soul and to soothe his sorrow, but also to uplift his uh, community and to break the ceiling for them so more people from his community to, could follow in his footsteps and become successful just like he did and I mean he was a legend in the 70s and 80s and so on and his routines often were about like urban characters and he was often honest about like uh, the work that he did he, he would be honest if you listen to his speeches and if you listen to his like comedy routines and skits and all that he performed in he would be telling you a lot of truth in those things, like for those that had the eyes and ears to like hear what he was saying, to describe what his life was really like and what he was going through. So comedy was just a mask that he was wearing, I believe, to shield all the pain that he had endured in his childhood. But at the same time, he, as a, as a builder and as a brother, he taught us that no matter what situation you found yourself in, you can get out of anything through hard work honesty and your grit and he's a prominent brother who made an impact on history because in the field of Hollywood and entertainment he broke the ceiling for uh, his fellow people to come in after that and succeed after him so I believe all of the big actors and comedians that exist today they owe it to Richard Pryor and the impact that he made because comedy and a good time and laughter brings people together. So that was also his way of racial equality, to fight for civil rights, not, not just to break the ceiling in the industries to get um, to open up the venue for more African-American entertainer, ent entertainers down the road. His job was also through comedy was to bring people together. So may his soul rest in peace and he may he get the peace that he finally deserved. Moving on, I would like to talk about Brother Sugar Ray Robinson, and whose uh, birth name is Walker Smith Jr., born May 3rd, 1921, and passed to the Celestial Grand Lodge above on April 12, 1989. He was an American professional boxer who competed from the 40s to the uh, mid-60s. He was a Hall of Famer, and at that time, before any African-American boxers came to the reins 
he was also the one that broke the ceiling in his own way for more prominent champions to come after him just like how brother Richard Pryor did in the world of entertainment and comedy so brother uh, Sugar Ray Robinson's favorite quote that I like is to be a champ you have to believe in yourself when no one else will now he's reinforcing the idea as a brother and as a builder the idea of know thyself is you nobody knows you better than you and most of the time to your life's problems you are the ones that you are the one that always has the answer to what you seek so always know thyself in all that you do and listen to your heart always and you shall never fail in all of your endeavors he was such a personality where even um he resisted even against the mob because at that time they they were always involved in the world of sports and entertainment and he also had a, a United States postal stamp dedicated to him for his dedications and contributions not just to the world of sports and boxing but to the African American community for the uh, ceiling that he broke through to make sure that those that came after him earned as much success as him or even more now he he often like uh, performed in the Walter rate and middle weight divisions and uh, he was also the one that like created the, the I guess the terminology of pound for pound amongst boxers so the pound for pound terminology actually comes from how brother Sugar Ray Robinson performed at his time because of his power and his weight and what he was always bringing to the table he was inducted into the uh, International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990 and he is regarded as the greatest boxer of all time and I, I think after I think after his his time he was ranked number one on the ring magazine's list of 80 fighters so besides Muhammad Ali and the Joe Frazier and all of them brother Sugar Ray Robinson was the one that actually did what he did to make sure that he was going to break the ceiling moving on I would like to talk about brother Shaquille O'Neal born March 6 1972 in New Jersey who's uh, an award-winning NBA champion four times and uh, currently retired and as an analyst on television program where he uh, analyzes on different things and does commentary he's one of the greatest players in uh, NBA history and one of the tallest as well, known for shattering the uh, the courts like whenever he made those shots. And throughout his career, he uh, played for six teams, 19-year uh, career, and also four-time NBA champ with the, uh, with the Lakers. Now, he also has a very prominent background, and one of his quotes that I like to share is, Excellent is not a singular act, but a habit. You are what you do repeatedly. So this is I, I like what Shaq is saying because he's telling you that when someone shows you who they are, you have to believe them. And if you want you want to be represented with good character and honor, then you have to make sure you represent that. So you are how you act and how you uh, how your etiquette is when dealing with others, even when hiding behind the guise of honors and titles and associations. Who you are as a person is in your heart, and that stays with you. So he's exemplifying that to all of us is to always be better in all that we do, we say, or we think because it all has a consequence. Now, a little bit about Brother Shaq's background is that he has a doctorate degree. He was cut from his high school team. Imagine that, a four-time NBA champ. And he's teaching us to never give up no matter what we do, growing up in a poor family in New Jersey. He's also been deputized as a deputy marshal. He has sold a platinum album as an artist, and he has also uh, invested a hundred million dollars in Colorado for uh, like a housing deal that that's intended for uh, lower income Colorado residents and mainly people of color. So Shaq has impacted his community not just as a role model for the African American community and the world in general. He is also behind the scenes without showing any any anything off he has invested much money into charities and into the uh, different subsidized housing communities to make sure that those uh, that that were from the lower housing background or people of color 
because he comes from the same background growing up in a poor family he made sure that whatever he earned he paid that forward so I wanted to make sure that brother Shaq not just as a champion but as a humanitarian was uh, recognized for what he did and even in uh, I guess in Portland in Maine in Portland in Colorado he has done a lot of investment and in buying different properties to make sure that those that were less fortunate have an uh, opportunity for subsidized housing so my love and respect for brother Shaq and uh, we still continue to love him and watch him doing what he does best now one of the most prominent figures of the civil rights movement up until this very day is Reverend Jesse Jackson or brother Reverend Re Jesse Jackson who was uh, real name is Jesse Louise Jackson senior born October 8, 1941. He's a civil rights activist, Baptist minister, and politician. And uh, he, was, he also ran for president in 1984 and 1988. And one of my favorite quotes from Brother uh, J Reverend Jesse Jackson is that never look down upon anybody unless you're helping him up, which is a definite of his character as a Mason and his background as a community activist. And he has such an extensive background where you go through his timeline. It shows that since he's been born and since his childhood, he's always had an affinity to show up, not, not, not just when any tragedy happens, but also to be involved wherever his people might need him. So he began his uh, civil rights journey in um, July 17, 1960. So they went into the library in a uh, public library in Greenville County, South Carolina, where they had a whites only sign. So obviously at the laws at the time, he was arrested and jailed and he had a lawyer file a suit on their behalf. And two months later, the library system abandoned the segregation of, of its downtown library. So because of his efforts in that early in the game as a Mason, as a brother and as a community activist, he was able to uh, make sure his community was respected and honored and treated as dignified human beings with his involvement in removing the segregation sign at the library because a place of education and learning should not be segregated. It's for all. So moving on with uh, Reverend Brother Jesse Jackson's work. In 1965, he participated in civil rights de demonstrations in Selma uh, in, a, in the state of Alabama, Selma, Alabama, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So he was involved in all of that since day one. And as time went on, he was chosen by Dr. King to head the Chicago branch of Operation Breadbasket. So that was an organization that strives to import, improve the economic condition of black communities across the nation a charitable organization that helped people of color to strive and to uplift their state state of being across the nation with the different chapters that existed throughout and a year later he's appointed national director of its uh, operations in uh, t 1968 he was ordained as a baptist minister so not only he is a he's a brother mason he's also a baptist minister and a community activist so after, as time went on, in 1971, he uh, left the uh, Operation Breadbasket community and formed his own Operation Push in Chicago, which is uh, an organization with the same agenda and to uh, help fallen humanity. And in 1983, he tried to run for president. 1984, he was involved in the securing the release of 48 Cuban and Cuban-American prisoners that were held in uh, Cuba and of a Navy lieutenant at the time, Robert Goodman, who was an African-American pilot held hostage in Syria. In uh, 1986, he founds the National Rainbow Coalition, a national social justice organization in Washington, D.C. So this brother has done a lot, not just for his community, but for people in general. And he has also negotiated release of prisoners he has showed up at uh, all the community events if any tragedy happens to somebody of a minority background he shows up so people always find a reason to hate on him but you know i tell them that no one is perfect 
no one is perfect in their life and no country or organization is perfect either and Reverend Jesse Jackson has always strived himself to help his uh, community and help people in general so I want to make sure that he's commended for that and he's still doing all of those things in, in all the ways possible at his current age last but not least I want to talk about brother Elijah Cummings who uh, served in the uh, House of Representatives in the United States government born January 18 1951 and passed away to the Celestial Grand Lodge above on October 17 2019 Brother Cummings was uh, a daring figure on his own, and one of the most favorite quotes that I like from him is, By providing students in our nation with such an education, we have, we have helped save our children from the clutches of poverty, crime, drugs, and hopelessness, and we help safeguard our nation's prosperity for generations yet unborn. So, he is reinforcing the same idea that Brother W.E.B. Du Bois said, that in order for us to uplift ourselves for anyone in general including the African American community they have to follow the path of education and to uh, become successful become successful businessmen homeowners educators degree holders uh, in the corporate world whatever have you for them to fully succeed in all that they do because Success is often the best plan to improvise against any system or any policy that has been put in place to prevent you from reaching any success. So you never give up, you continue fighting the good fight, and you achieve all of those things uh, the system said that you couldn't achieve, then you practically won your fight against whatever what agenda that was laid out against you. And that's what Brother Elijah Cummings, God rest his soul, is enforcing us that we have to make sure that our children and their children are educated if we want to save our future generations from the clutches of being a statistic and to get them off the streets. So going into a little bit about Brother Elijah's background, he grew up himself in a segregated city, re recalling when he was just like 12 years old at the time being stoned and beaten every day for a week as uh, you know the local african-american community tried to use a swimming pool in a white area of the city which is appalling for that to happen to a twelve-year-old child when his mother died he recalled that do not let them take our votes away so his mother enforced that fire in him and lit that fire under him and um, told him that elijah make sure whatever you do we have the right to vote, we have the right to a dignified human existence, and don't let anyone take that away from us. And you continue fighting your fight as hard as you can. So his parents believed in the idea of education because they had little. And you see that in today's world where parents who grew up illiterate, when they, when they, they have children, they make sure they give them the best education possible because they want to give them something that they never had so they can pass that on to their children. So, Brother Cummings was a graduate of Howard University in Washington. He uh, then earned his uh, law degree at the University of Maryland. So, as time went on, he started practicing law as an attorney. He served in the Maryland House of Delegates, and he made history in uh, between the years of 1983 and 1996, uh, becoming the state's first legislator of an African-American background speaking on all the different issues as a speaker that he could and in the year of 1996 he was elected to his first term in Congress for Maryland 7th District where he subsequently served until his passing in 2019 so till his last breath he did what he loved and he did what he did and he had a special election called when the uh, I guess the uh, the congressman at the time he resigned to become a head of the uh, no, excuse me on the uh, last slide I got cut off there so what I was saying is that uh, brother Elijah Cummings he uh, became on to become the representative of Maryland 7th district for 12 times and he did a lot for his community now, before his death, it's unfortunate that there was a lot of hate that went around, but 
I want to make sure that his memory and his legacy legacy is preserved for everyone to honor him. So now I thank you all for watching. If any questions or comments, please email me at selmanshake911 at gmail.com. Let's celebrate our Prince Hall and African American brothers in this month of Black History Month that I'm honoring in the month of February 2020 for their contribution not, not just towards their community, but towards humanity and mankind in general. And all images used in this presentation retrieved from Google and protected under copyright laws of fair use for the purpose of education and awareness. So I thank you all for watching and uh, please learn from what all these brothers taught us and uh, live those examples in all that you do through your actions, through your thoughts and deeds and love one another because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Thank you and God bless all of you and your families and all that you do. Thank you again.